Well, perfect. Uh, if uh, folks watching, if you don't know James, James is an accomplished naturalist, a uh, fantastic person and good friend here to Teradice Nature Center. Uh, and was kind enough to prepare this uh, Mammals of the Olentangy presentation for us. So without further ado, James, I will let you add it. All right. Tyler, give me a, a little crash course. So I got to do this again. <laughs> All right. Perfect. James is a professional here. All right. Can we, can we see it? Absolutely. All right, wonderful, wonderful. So, uh, so again, yep, my name is uh, James Anderson and uh, today I'm gonna be talking about the mammals of the Olentangy. So I do wanna note a couple things. One of the things, uh, I will kind of repeat this again. Uh, this is not gonna be exactly every mammal of the Olentangy. Uh, we just wanna kind of keep this presentation kind of short and simple. Um, we just, you know, kind of keep a time, time restraint also too. I tried my very best to keep a lot of our pictures that you're about to see local. Uh, unfortunately, there are a few I, I did have to grab off of the internet, um, but I did my very best um, that uh, the pictures are at least from Marion County. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive on in. Uh, so uh, I always start out just, uh, just kind of talk about some of our parks that are kind of sprawled around uh, Marion County. This is just a uh, township map of, uh, of Marion County. So. Uh, we have Teradice Nature Preserve, which is right across from uh, Tyler's facility at the Teradice Nature Center. Uh, then we uh, have the Greenspur Nature Preserve. Uh, this is right across if for our, our older audience. If you remember where the old power plant used to be, uh, directly across from that, that's where this park is located. Uh, this was John Watkins. This was uh, his property, and he helped donated this park to us in 2004. And it sits basically in the corner of State Route 4 and State Route 203. Uh, then we have Myers Woods, which is on Marion Wyduck County Road, right across from Kildare Plains Wildlife Area. Uh, this was actually our first park donated in 1995 from uh, one of our former judges, Charleston Myers. Uh, I always love, this is probably my favorite park, even, even though it's small, it's still got a lot of great biodiversity. Uh, now we do have one in the village of Caledonia. It's not accessible at this time. Uh, we're hoping in the near future, we'll have some type of uh, accessibility. But the one park you've probably heard of or been to is Marion Tallgrass Trail. Uh, that's our big biking, hiking trail here in Marion County. So uh, it's 12.4 miles. So it starts on the west side by Whirlpool off of Holland Road and into the Harding County line. So you can walk it, you can bike it um, at the lake and go fishing, canoeing and kayaking. So we offer a lot of different recreational opportunities um, at our parks. So I always like starting now uh, the mammals program. What makes a mammal? What makes mammals uh, special? What makes them unique from other different groups of organisms? So uh, there's about over 5,500 different species of mammals across the world, and uh, they come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. So our smallest one is the hognose bat, uh, weighs less than an ounce. And then we have the, uh, a big blue whale that is uh, over 100 feet long, it's over 100 tons. So as you can see, a lot, a lot of diversity when it comes to physical features, also to habitats, niches, I mean, you name it. Uh, mammals are just very, very diverse. I mean, a lot of organisms are well as well, but um, I always like uh, mammals, just, just all the, the, the unique diversity that there is here on planet Earth. So what all mammals have in common, rather you're from the smallest bat to the largest whale, they're all vertebrates, so they all have a spine, a backbone. They are all endothermic or warm-blooded, so and they're also to uh, control their body temperatures, so sweat to cool down, um, shiver to kind of warm up, versus our cool-blooded cool animals really don't have that feature. But uh, rather, again, you're from the smallest uh, bat to the largest whale, what all mammals have in common is they all have hair. Now, I know you're probably thinking, but what about the, the mammals like naked mole rats or those really ugly cat breeds uh, that you see that have absolutely no hair? What about whales and dolphins? You've probably never seen a, a hairy whale before, have you? So for whales and dolphins, they do have hair, but it's about the right end of their nose or in the nostrum region. And um, it's, uh, it's very microscopic, very small. So they lose it as they get older because whales and dolphins, they don't really need uh, hair to survive because um, they, they're very thick, warm-blooded uh, mammals. 
Um, but the other uh, thing that makes all mammals have in common is they're able to produce milk uh, to feed their babies. So when you grab that 5,500 different species of mammals across the world, uh, they split them up into three different groups or categories based on the reproductive structure. Um, our first one are monotremes. And I know when you were probably thinking of what makes mammals a mammal, you're probably saying, oh, they all give live birth. A good chunk of them do, but we do have our outliers, our I always call freaks of nature, um, the egg layers. So that are, our examples would be the platypus or the, uh, the echidnas. Uh, now these guys, we don't have any representation in the United States or the state of Ohio. Uh, these guys are out in Australia. Um, but it would be pretty cool if we had them in Ohio, especially platypus. I think they're pretty unique. So the another group that you probably all have heard are marsupials. So marsupials are kind of like us, but they are a little bit different. One of the big things is they're uh, born very, very early in their gestational period. So most of them are born within about two weeks. And most of them are about the size of a dime or a lima bean. And so once they're born, they'll, they'll crawl up and they'll drop down mom's pouch. And uh, yes, a pouch is another characteristic for most marsupials. There are a couple marsupials that do not have pouches, but they'll stay in there for a period of time and then they'll nurse on, on the mama's nipples. And then as they get older, they'll get either run around or crawl on mama's back like an opossum. Um, so What's pretty, new, uh, pretty cool about uh, marsupials is they can raise different stages of young simultaneously. They can raise the ones in their ovaries, the ones in their pouches, and obviously the older ones that are outside of them. So uh, really, really unique. So out of that 5,500, there's about uh, 330 different, 334 species of marsupials across the world. Most of them are found out in Australia, kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, Tasmanian devils, sugar gliders. Uh, now, luckily, we do have a representation here in the United States in the state of Ohio, our only marsupial, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, but the good old um, opossums. So then we have our last group, our placenta mammals. So these guys uh, make up uh, the, the, the mammal group. And uh, now we do have to keep in mind, rather, you know, you are a placenta mammal, the, the, uh, the gestation period can be very, very different from a mouse is about 30 days to a cow's about nine months. And so rather again, you're from the smallest mouse to the largest cow, basically the placenta is a special embryonic organ that basically attaches to the fetus and supplies nutrients, so supplies oxygen um, until that young is born. Now, uh, I know we could keep going on about, uh, you know, the, 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 the different stages or the artricial or percocial uh, mammals, but basically, you know, you have your mammals that are born defenseless or the ones that are born more advanced, like cows and sheep and horses and deer. But as I mentioned earlier, they make up the, 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 the big group of mammals, so about 4,500 different species. Um, so that includes cats, dogs, horses, cows, mice, and I even included humans myself, and good old Buckeye Chuck, the, uh, our good old state groundhog. So what, is it, what does Ohio look like when it comes to uh, biodiversity for the mammals? Uh, so out of that 5,500 species. So they think there could have been roughly about 65 native species in pre-settlement times. Uh, so before people really uh, established here in the state of Ohio. Um, but unfortunately over time, we lost about 12 different species. And the next slide I'll kind of explain about that. Uh, so they think roughly we have about 53 species currently living in the state of Ohio. So from the smallest rodent to the largest deer. So what does Marion County look like? Um, I looked at the uh, Mammals of Ohio publication. I think roughly there's about 40, 41 different species of mammals in Marion County. Uh, so most of them are permanent. We do have some of our migrators, uh, like at the bottom right, as you see that long ear bat, the Indiana bat. Uh, which uh, have been found at Marion Tallgrass Trail. Uh, these guys are summer residents, but overall, most of these guys you can find uh, year round. So why did we lose some of our furry friends? So as we mentioned, you know, uh, when Ohio and pre-settlement times, as people were coming in, uh, they obviously had to build and grow. So we had to uh, tear down these natural areas. We had to do some farming. 
And uh, of course, when you have farming, you have to create uh, settlements, towns, cities, things like that. Now, I include a manifest destiny. And uh, I know if you've probably been in history class that that kind of began in about the 1850s. And I know Ohio was already a state by then. And this philosophy was basically for, for the West. But basically, the, the view was, you know, I can do whatever I want with this piece of land. You know, I can destroy it and I can rebuild it into my vision and my dream. Rather, again, it's a farm or a, a small settlement. So this view is even around to today. Um, unfortunately, and, you know, we do lose some of our natural areas. And uh, kind of speaking of farmers, uh, back in the pre-settlement times, like I tell kids, you know, there wasn't Walmarts or McDonald's or places like that. You had to depend on your livelihood. And if you have things like predators, like uh, wolves and mountain lions and bobcats, and they're trying to affect your livelihood, well, you got to do something. So we lost a lot of our natural predators throughout the years. Luckily, some of them have come back like bobcats in the state of Ohio, but some we will probably never ever see out in the wild like wolves or mountain lions. All right, so without further ado, uh, we are gonna get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation. Uh, so I put this, the, the picture of Flo, the friends of the lower Olentangy watershed. Um, as I was making this presentation, um, I reached out to them. And I said, hey, do you have any publications, resources uh, when it comes to mammals? Uh, they did throw me something out. Uh, they, it was an appendix that they made in 2005, basically showing about the biodiversity, not just mammals, but birds, plants, just about everything uh, you can think of along the uh, Olentangy. So um, they're, they're, I know when I talked to them, they were really hoping to update it before too long because uh, some things have come and unfortunately some things have, have gone uh, when it comes to the biodiversity along the uh, Olentangy. Uh, so like I said earlier, this is not every mammal that you're, you're going to find. I know you can probably find a lot more. This is just a very small list uh, that I uh, just wanted to show you. So something you're going to hear me say uh, quite often, you're going to hear me say uh, extirpated. Um, now, some of you might know what that means. Some of you might have, what in the world is that? but I bet you heard of extinct or extinction. So what's the difference? So extinction or extinct are creatures or animals that have uh, been here on earth and they're gone forever. Dinosaurs are a great example of that. And then extirpated, think of it as local extinction. So yes, their species is gone in Ohio, but luckily their species is thriving in other parts of the world. Um, so we're, uh, again, you're going to hear me say that one word a lot, um, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to some of our mammals. So kind of a little outline of what we're just going to basically talk, just some of the, uh, some basic ecology, just uh, think, things that you, where, where you can find them. We might talk a little bit about identification. Um, and uh, as you've probably been watching the last few slides, I'm very big into Ohio wildlife history, probably one of my top five uh, favorite things to teach. Um, so I'll definitely give on some of these uh, mammals, some of the, the history that we had uh, with them. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about some of our uh, semi-aquatic mammals. Uh, some of you might know what this word means. Uh, so basically break it down, semi is partially, aquatic is, you know, means lives in the water. So semi-aquatic put it together are creatures that live or designed to live in, uh, on land and on water or in water, excuse me. And then truly aquatic, think of fish, they are designed to live in water all of their lives. So being a semi-aquatic mammal, you're gonna have some special features, some special adaptations. Uh, one of the things is called a nictini membrane. Uh, so think of it as a special skin. So for the eyes region, uh, think of it like swim goggles. You've ever been inside a pool, you know, when you dive under, you know, as you get the swim goggles, you're able to see a lot clearly. I know I always enjoy uh, putting goggles on. Well, these animals need that special uh, eyelid or skin. So they're able to see underwater, find food, escape from predation, uh, very, very important feature. Now for the nose and the ears, it's like a special skin or a special fowl. And I think of it like a door. So as they're diving under, it's like a door, it shuts. So water isn't completely rushing in. Uh, so again, having this nictini membrane is uh, pretty important for these animals. Um, so the other adaptation is you're going to have specialized fur. So if you ever felt a beaver, muskrat, and otter pelts, um, as you kind of 
pull your, your hand through, you're going to notice a lot of the very dense fur. It's going to be very, very well insulated, obviously, to keep the, um, the mammal warm. So it's not going to be freezing to death. And then if you feel that top layer, it's going to feel really greasy, very oily. Um, so that special oil called castrum. Um, beavers have a special gland kind of around the region around where their tail. Um, and that's how they, uh, they grab that gland or grab that oil and they spread it all throughout their bodies. Um, so again, very, very important. Able to conserve oxygen is a very important adaptation. Uh, now, some of them do a little bit differently, but like beavers, they have a little bit larger lungs, a um, little bit larger livers to kind of dis uh, distribute uh, oxygen throughout the body. And then of course, having specialized lens. So having kind of webbed or partially webbed uh, front feet, hind feet, or both. Um, otters have very long tails. Uh, it's like a rotor of a boat. So again, very important to help move in any type of water setting. All right, so we're gonna start with uh, my favorite mammal of all time is the beaver. So um, I am gonna try to pronounce some of the scientific names, but I can't pronounce all of them. So I might have to skip on uh, some of these names. But uh, for beaver, Castor canadensis, uh, these guys are in their own group, their own family, the Castoridae family. And uh, these guys are primarily herbivores, strictly herbivores, and they primarily eat uh, woody vegetation. So here in the state of Ohio, they're going to go things like cottonwoods, uh, willows, aspens, things like that. Now, when they're found in more in the northwestern part of the uh, United States, they're going to eat more of your evergreen trees. And actually, I learned this uh, from someone that uh, when they're young, they actually are only adapted to the certain tree species because um, their stomachs get used to those tree species. And so they develop these certain digestive enzymes. And so the problem is, is if you were to grab a beaver from Ohio and introduce it into Alaska, let's say, um, it would have a little bit hard time uh, you know, with those uh, trees, those evergreen trees, if that's gonna be its primary diet and kind of vice versa. You know, if we brought that Alaska beaver to Ohio. So um, that's very, very important. If you're going to introduce beavers, you know, make sure you have that, that plentiful food source that, um, that the, what they grew up on. Now, they will also eat herbaceous uh, vegetation. So uh, they will eat cattails. They will eat mushrooms. They will eat uh, if they're near a, a, a cornfield, soybean field, um, especially if they're at the creek or stream is right next to it. They'll definitely take advantage of that. So where to basically find these guys is any type of fresh water setting, but basically very calm and quiet waters. Uh, ponds and wetlands are a really great place to find them. Uh, here in Marion County, we're very fortunate um, of having a, a decent beaver population. And uh, actually not too far away where uh, Tyler is, um, right by uh, River Valley. And I forget what creek or stream it is, but a, a few weeks ago, I did a a uh, macroinvertebrate uh, class with the science crew, uh, crew and uh, we, uh, we noticed that there was beavers uh, starting to build a, a small dam over there. And I actually have a little treat for you. Um, here in the next couple slides, um, I have a little video that my boss, Dan Sheridan, made. So this is a picture from Marion Tallgrass Trail, so a really great way to identify it other than that really weird looking tail and the web feet that you saw in the previous slide. Um, because when you know when you're looking at beavers, most of the time are going to be in that water setting. But when you notice on the on the face, it's got that really really large nose. Versus muskrats, their nose is not um, as big. And then I, I kind of think it's funny the beavers' eyes are are kind of really uh, itty bitty versus some of the other uh, semi aquatic creatures. Their eyes are a little bit uh, larger. Um, and sometimes you might be lucky, you might be able to get them uh, with their tail sticking up. Actually, I think I have a picture. Yes, uh, this was from Lola Pryor. Um, and this was actually uh, there uh, between um, the, uh, the Teradice Nature Preserve and the Teradice Nature Center. I wanna say she got this last year or the year before. Uh, but as you can see in this picture, he's flapping his tail. Uh, it's a really great form of communication. Um, you probably have, might have learned that in school or in books or in movies, but they, they do focalize, they do uh, use uh, focalized communication, and sometimes they will, uh, like we talked about earlier with that castrum oil, they will kind of uh, make marks, um, especially um, near their lodges, because they definitely don't want other beavers uh, kind of to uh, in, intrude their, their territory. 
So here I'm going to show you. This is a, a three-minute video. Um, this is my boss, Dan Sheridan, made. Uh, it's funny, at Tallgrass Trail, uh, we, we just have just a fun joke that, that Dan declared war with the beavers. No, he doesn't hurt them or anything. Uh, so he, he would try to dredge out their dam. And uh, within a day or two later, they would just clog it back up. And he would just, he would try and try and try again. And so he's like, okay, I want to see what do they do. So he borrowed a, a special trail camera that took footage. And uh, he set it up just in one night. And uh, he dredged the dam and he wanted to see, okay, what do these beavers do? And you're going to see here uh, in the next slide. Oh, excuse me. I'll go back to that one. Well, this is what it's supposed to look like at Tallgrass Trail. So we believe this is the male. And then in the back, we don't know if it's a female or if it's a young, um, a young beaver. But he's bringing the male resources. But as you can see, they're very, very good at what they do. He's angling those sticks. Uh, we, we believe there's about four of them out here. And this is what it looks like. All right. So um, as you, I don't know if you're paying attention in the bottom right. So we think it took roughly about four to five hours for them to make that relatively small dam. And they'll keep continuously uh, building that, uh, that dam. And it's actually kind of funny, uh, kind of since COVID has started, uh, one of my park board members and I, we've kind of dressed it out a little more because uh, the, the disadvantage of one of our, uh, our beaver friends at Tallgrass Trail is, is they cause our, our water levels to be about five feet higher than normal. So when we get a good rain, um, our typically our east side or especially our northeast side typically is uh, underwater. So. Um, so again, I hope you enjoy that video. If you uh, want to see it again, you can go on YouTube and I just tell people, uh, type in Tallgrass Trail Beavers. It's under uh, Dan Sheridan's account. So. Um, but, um, and this diagram kind of just shows you why they build dams. Um, they're, they're the, they're the, the purpose is, is they want uh, the water to be very quiet so they're able to maneuver a lot easier than when the water's continuously uh, moving. Also too, as you see in this diagram, 
Um, a lot of that food they're storing down at the bottom. Uh, it's think of it like a pantry. Um, that's what they do a lot during the fall season. They, they, they store a lot of their branches down there. And uh, when they build their lodge, they make that under uh, water entrance. So they're able to grab that food. But if they don't dam it up, then the water levels can't stay as high. And then your chance of your pond or lake or whatever can freeze completely over. And of course, the beavers don't really want that to happen. So a little uh, sad history about the beavers. Um, 1830 is when they believe that the beavers were extirpated in the state of Ohio um, from overhunting, uh, definitely uh, pollution of their uh, natural habitat. And we went about 106 years without beavers in the state of Ohio. Um, they believe it was about uh, 1936 is when uh, that they were spotted again. So. Um, but they were coming back naturally. Um, and then I think later on the Fish and Wildlife did introduce uh, some beavers uh, back to the state, but wasn't really until the 80s where we were uh, legally allowed to uh, trap them. So uh, not very big trapping in, in today in the United States, but other parts of Europe, uh, they are. All right, so I'm gonna quickly go through that. All right, so muskrat. So these guys get uh, confused a lot with beavers because uh, a lot of times muskrats will live in the same habitat, same areas as beavers. Um, and sometimes uh, you can see them swim by each other at Marion Tallgrass Trail. I have seen that happen. Um, but the next picture I'll kind of show you uh, will be a little bit easier to see uh, how to identify them a little bit different uh, from beavers. But excuse me, now what makes them a little bit different is their diet. Um, as we talked about before that beavers is primarily woody vegetation. Uh, muskrats are primarily herbaceous for vegetation, so they're really strong on the, the cattails, pickle weed, uh, things like that. Uh, now, it's actually kind of funny. Sometimes you can find muskrats lodging with beavers. Uh, no, they don't get along, so sometimes I've seen in documentaries that muskrats will sometimes make their lodge either um, higher than where the beavers are actually uh, denning in the lodge or lower. Uh, but they're basically in that same type of habitat in uh, ponds, marshes, wetlands. Um, you find them again in more of those habitats in like creeks and streams. Um, I have seen them along the Olentangy River before, um, but just from time to time. So uh, these guys were also taken um, from Tallgrass Trail of these uh, pictures, but I know it's kind of hard to see the, the tails being covered either in water or duckweed, that little uh, green stuff you're seeing. Um, but sometimes when they're night and when they're swimming, you, you can sometimes get a nice glimpse of their uh, long linear tail versus beavers have those really uh, flat like tails. Um, and then also too, uh, muskrats are a little bit more lin linear in structure versus beavers are really compacted, very rounded. Uh, that's how I always remember. Um, but remember when we looked at the beaver's face, remember his nose was really, really big. As you kind of look into the, the muskrat pictures, their nose are not as big. Uh, their ears are definitely not as rounded as beavers. Uh, so that can be another way to uh, de identify uh, against uh, beavers. But so, again, sometimes it can be confusing. I've, I have mistaken muskrats uh, before and vice versa. So uh, here is a picture of a, a one of the lodges uh, that they do make. Uh, but uh, again, instead of uh, woody vegetation, they use the her herbaceous vegetation. Uh, this is at the Greenspur Nature Preserve, which is our park we mentioned earlier out by Prospect. And uh, this, uh, this actually can get pretty tall. Um, I think one year they had it almost about four feet tall. So uh, they will try to reuse it. Uh, but there was one year we had a lot, a lot of rain and it did get flooded out. Um, I didn't see uh, much activity this summer. So maybe hopefully they'll come back. So again, if you're at the Greenspur and you uh, look at Watkins Pond, um, which is, we, we uh, did that for remembrance of uh, John Watkins. All right, so mink. So uh, one of our fishiest carnivores we have here in the state of Ohio, as, as well with our uh, other uh, weasels that we have. Uh, but if you're gonna have muskrats, you're definitely gonna have minks. Minks just absolutely, I love muskrats. And it's actually funny, sometimes muskrats will get a little bit larger than minks uh, with uh, weight wise, but uh, like with the weasels, I always teach people that I know it sounds mean and sounds vicious, but what they do is they jump on top of their prey, they use their sharp teeth, they dig down in that spinal cord until the prey can't really move very well. And uh, 
And then once that happens, uh, that kind of paralyzes the prey, and then they go through the throat and then kill their prey. Now, these guys, uh, when it comes to habitat, uh, you really find them in creek stream um, environments. Um, so these guys, uh, especially around Big Island Wildlife Area, we have seen them along uh, Marion Tallgrass Trail uh, quite often, uh, especially around the 203 Wildlife Area, be, or around the 203 section where the wildlife area is, excuse me, um, because there's a lot of brushy area, a lot of creeks and streams running through. Um, so you really can find them. And it's actually kind of funny when you see them crossing the trail, they do that slinky effect. They just kind of uh, do that uh, little wave uh, motion. So that's pretty cool. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention about the muskrat, which is uh, a, just a, a tad bit of the Ohio history, um, it's actually very important. In 1829, um, the state of Ohio actually tried to help create a, a law to protect them uh, by creating a, a season. Um, because at that time, again, you could go at any time of the year, kill as many as you want. Um, and this was a very big step in the state of Ohio and the United States, because at this time, we weren't really viewing natural resources, um, you know, as it was declining. We just kept thinking it was always going to be there, it was always going to be abundant. But um, the problem was the, the Ohio Division wildlife wasn't around. So, of course, game wardens weren't around. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of these guys were, uh, were kicked out. Now, there's no records of muskrats being extirpated. But as we mentioned in the beavers, the year after in 1830, um, they were extirpated in the state of Ohio. So, but luckily, again, we can find uh, beavers in most counties and muskrats you can find in most counties as well. So here's a, a nice picture. Um, uh, this is not uh, mine. Uh, this is also from the internet. But uh, a, a lot of people get uh, river otters and minks confused because they're long and linear. Now, minks are definitely a lot smaller, but I don't know if you can see right under where its chin would be. Um, the, the minks have that nice uh, white chin strap versus otters do not. Uh, so that can be a, a really cool way to identify them. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of our non-semi-aquatic mammals. So for some of these, I'm going to kind of briefly talk about, so, but you definitely could tell again about beavers were my favorite. So Eastern cocktail rabbits, I, I took this picture out by Tallgrass Trail my first year out by our, uh, our Port of John. But uh, yeah, you definitely can see these guys uh, in any big open land areas. Um, they'll definitely hug around uh, river banks, especially where they can find food of any uh, burrows around, uh, close by. Uh, very, very common. Strictly herb, her, uh, herbivore. Um, so, uh, and what's really really neat about the habitats. So rather you're from a natural area, but they can even be found in urban and suburban environments. So here's a picture that you'll see a lot of uh, cocktail rabbits and groundhogs do. They'll stand on their hind legs, they'll look around, they're trying to look for threats. Um, this kind of gives them a, a better view. Um, and obviously with those larger ears, they're able to pick up, you know, sound waves a little bit easier. Um, so, you know, really can help them escape from uh, predation. Now, these guys are very, very important uh, when it comes to um, for our predator population, because they are obviously going to be supplying a, a predator uh, a nice meal. And, you know, mice, mice will keep a, a coyote or a fox, you know, full for a little bit, but a rabbit's really going to really do justice. And if you're, you know, your, rob, your rabbit population is down, definitely your, your other predators are going to be down as well. So very, very important in the uh, food chain and the ecosystem. All right, so our next little mammal is the uh, eastern mole. So cute little guy. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you will not find them above ground. I've only seen one mole alive above ground. Most of them, if I see them above, they're usually dead. Um, usually I'll go to people's houses or, or, or uh, around golf courses. They'll, uh, of course, they'll try to trap them. They can be a nuisance species, um, but a lot of people will, will mistake them as mice. Uh, now, these guys, yes, do have eyes. I will show you a picture, but they're just really, really itty, itty, itty bitty. Uh, these guys are known what's called semi-fossorial. So like we talked about, semi-aquatic. Uh, so they live in the ground, underneath the ground, um, a good chunk of their time of their lives and come above ground to either find food or probably a mate or something like that. Very important to help create aeration um, with, within the soil with, uh, with earthworms. Um, that's a primary, their diet is um, those um, invertebrates. And of course, you can find them in your gardens. But 
Another great way to identify your moles, as you see in this picture, uh, again, this is from the internet, but uh, there's large, large shovel-like uh, hands. Excellent, excellent for digging. Versus mice are just gonna have those tiny little paws. And yes, I mean, mice can, can bury or, or you know dig a little bit, but they can't do justice like the mole. And I know in this picture, he looks like he has no eyes, but again, they're just really itty, itty bitty. But it's got that really long, nice snout. Uh, excellent for picking up um, some of those prey species as we uh, mentioned earlier. And if you ever felt a mole fur, it's actually very velvety. Um, I figure it actually would have been very coarse like a groundhog. Uh, but when I was at Hawking College, um, one of our college professors uh, trapped a, a mole um, and uh, he, he uh, humanely put it down and he used it for experiment or for, uh, for purposes like for our wildlife identification class. And uh, he let us touch it. And yeah, it's, it's really interesting just how, how soft a, a mole's fur is. And I think his joke was, he said, you know, you need a hundred of these or so or more to, to uh, make a coat. So our shrews, I kind of put the shrews together um, because uh, a lot of times you'll find them in, in the same area. I'll show you the, the next slide um, with their habitats. Uh, but I have never seen a mash shrew before. I would love to see one. I, I heard they're really a unique uh, shrew species in the state of Ohio. But the one I constantly see, it, the the, uh, the short tail shrew. This is the one that if you have cats, these are the ones that your cats will love to give to you as a as a gift all year long, right? So, um, but as you can see, when it comes to identification, that mash shrew, I mean, has that really almost looks like elephant kind of like face for that really long nose, almost looks like a long trunk. Definitely a lot browner uh, color versus the short tail shrew, kind of has more of that, that mole-like uh, fur. So for the ecology, uh, for the mash shrew, uh, these guys will really hug, hug against uh, uh, riverbanks, uh, but they also like kind of thick areas. But for short tail shrews, they're more, just more thicket areas. Usually I, I haven't seen Shrews along riverbanks, um, but for the mass shrew, I guess they're they're found there more often. Uh, but when it comes to diets, uh, they both eat seeds, fungi, and insects. So meadow foals. So meadow foals, a uh, cute little guy. Um, these guys get often mistaken as mice as well, um, but these guys are also very very important with the uh, the ecosystem. Um, especially like we talked about with predators, with coyotes, foxes, but the big thing is owls. And I bet that the one guy who will talk about owl species, if you ever dissected a, uh, an owl pellet, a good chunk of the time you will find metal full um, skulls, bones, things like that. So these guys definitely uh, kind of like rabbits, as we talked about earlier, and kind of moles, they're kind of more in that, that open land ha habitat. Um, really haven't found them in very foresty areas uh, because they probably want more of that very loose soil. Um, but they're primarily herbivores. They do eat seeds as well. But for identifying uh, against a, a house mouse, uh, I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, they have kind of, their ears look kind of tucked within their fur versus mice. Their ears kind of definitely pop out a lot more. Um, and then if you ever seen a, a metal fool skull, it actually looks very similar to a muskrat skull, but size is obviously the, the big characteristic uh, with the, uh, the differences. All right, so gray squirrel, I bet you guys have seen these guys quite often. Uh, so these guys are primarily herbivores. Every once in a while they have reported they will eat eggs, they will eat baby birds, but most of it's gonna be acorns, hickories, fungi, different seeds. Um, and these guys can be a lot of different kind of uh, diverse habitats. So um, it's actually kind of funny. They think that the gray squirrel is one of the few native squirrel species that we had in the state of Ohio. Um, and I know you're probably thinking about fox squirrels, but they don't think fox squirrels were, were native, or at least they weren't very abundant. They think the first fox squirrel was spotted in about 1838. Um, because as we were coming through Ohio, like I talked about earlier, and we were kind of opening things up, fox squirrels kind of like more open forest habitat versus gray squirrels. You can find them in open, but you also can find them in very closed habitats as well, um, or forest habitats. And uh, they actually said in the state of Ohio that we were so thick with trees that a gray squirrel could start in Cincinnati and end in Cleveland without touching the ground. 
that's how thick we were with uh, with trees. And uh, we had a very dark history with squirrels, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of a, a sad but silly what, what we did. Uh, in 1807, um, in a lot of our eastern uh, uh, towns in, in the state, um, they were such, such a bad, bad nuisance that um, the county clerk required you that you had to kill a minimum of 10 squirrels. Now, if you were to say kill seven, you were charged three cents per scout that you did not kill. Now, I know three cents does not sound like a lot of money, but in 1807, add that up. Add, that, that was probably a quite, quite a bit of money for, especially for a family that was just moving into, uh, into Ohio. Also another really uh, sad, uh, sad story, and again, this is kind of a silly story, but in 1822, uh, around the Columbus regions, uh, gray squirrels were such a, a, a problem as well that uh, the people, uh, they had a competition of who could kill the mo most squirrels. So they had a day that they picked and uh, they basically split um, the, the, the Franklin County region, like a north and a south side. And uh, whoever killed the most got several gallons of, uh, of whiskey. And they said the, uh, the Columbus Gazette uh, reported about over 20,000 gray squirrels that were killed. And they said that didn't even put a dent. Uh, this is not the very first time that we uh, have done that to wildlife. Down in Granville, in Licking County, they did a similar uh, hunting uh, party uh, with uh, rattlesnakes. So uh, we again, we were not very kind to a, a lot of our uh, our a lot of our wildlife. But uh, for for uh, back for uh, identification, so kind of the difference between them and the fox squirrel, um, as you can see. Uh, the gray squirrel within their name get that gray coat versus the fox squirrels, more of that salt and pepper. Also too, gray squirrels have more of the white underneath sign versus the, the fox squirrel. It can be reddish orange, more uh, tan brown. Um, I've seen quite, quite a diversity when it comes to, to the underneath side with uh, fox squirrels. But this was probably one of my most favorite pictures. This was from Amy Holloway. This was from her uh, backyard. Um, but this was, uh, she took a picture. This was like, I think a year or two ago, as you can see a very thick uh, snowfall falling down and he looks like he's praying, say, oh, please, please let, uh, let the snow be over. Um, but in Marion County, yes, we do have a black squirrel uh, population. A lot of people ask, uh, what, are they a different species? Kind of yes and kind of no. Um, black squirrels can be either a fox squirrel or a gray squirrel with a genetic mutation. Um, but in some regions, sometimes the fox squirrels and the gray squirrels kind of do intertwine with each other. And then the, uh, the fox squirrel kind of carries a gene, a kind of a more darker dominant gene that kind of carries over. Um, and then in this squirrel, um, he has a, a white tip at the end. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Mike Watson, uh, Diane Watson. She's uh, one of our uh, park board members. And I think one of your members at the Teradice uh, Nature Center as well. And uh, yeah, they, they said they just have this uh, squirrel just uh, running around and it's just very uh, odd looking. But at Marion Tallgrass Trail, I have not seen a black squirrel. And, and that, kind of talking about that, more of the black squirrels I tend to hear are more in your urban, suburban environments versus your, you know, your gray squirrels, you're gonna find more in your uh, natural areas. Oh, groundhogs, oh, all right. So this is probably my second most favorite mammal of all time. Uh, big reason why is a uh, good old Buckeye Chuck, uh, our state groundhog. Uh, he was appointed in 1979, uh, good old Charlie Evers, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's the guy to help uh, promote the uh, groundhog here in the state of Ohio. Uh, so Marmona Moxis, or another names you might have called a groundhog is woodchuck or whistle pig, or my two other favorite names for a groundhog is uh, lamb beaver or mouse bears. And then you're like, mouse bears, that's a weird name. So Native Americans used to call them that because what groundhogs and bears have in common is they'll uh, stand on their hind legs and kind of look around. Uh, and they're kind of like the, the gray color of a, of a mouse. So another fun fact about groundhogs, a lot of people don't realize, they are one of the largest ones in the squirrel family here in the state of Ohio. Yes, they do climb trees. Uh, here recently, uh, we had somebody that got a picture of one at Marion Tallgrass Trail climbing one. Uh, they primarily do it for two reasons, to either find food or to escape from predation. 
Uh, this one, apparently our trail user said that he went around and looked at where his burrow was and uh, it was completely flooded. So he might have tried to get into a higher ground. Uh, but coming back with uh, rabbits, they, uh, they're in the more of the open land, grassland habitats, anywhere where you're gonna have that really uh, loose soil, uh, that's where you're gonna find them. And now their burrow system is really, really unique. Uh, they can go uh, six feet down, 10 feet wide, and they make different rooms or uh, what's called chambers. And uh, right now, some of our groundhogs are active, but with this warm snap, it's kind of in increased their activity. But here soon, when we really start getting cold, we're not gonna see them because they're gonna be hibernating and they're gonna have their hibernation chamber or where they're gonna sleep. They do have a kind of a pantry chamber. They do have a bathroom chamber. And if it's a female, she does have a chamber uh, for raising her young. And I always tell kids, you know, that when this groundhog, you know, either dies or, um, or leaves, he leaves home behind for other wildlife. So snakes, uh, badgers, foxes, coyotes, rabbits, I mean, you name it, groundhogs are very, very important uh, for the ecosystem because they provide many homes for a lot of different wildlife. So this is found along the Scioto River. Uh, this is uh, one of our other trail users. This was by his house. Um, but as you can see, they have that uh, very coarse fur. So if, uh, we have a few groundhog pelts or, or mounts, I should say. And uh, you feel them, yeah, that's not very soft like the other animals because their fur is designed when that dirt hits it, it kind of pushes off. So kind of think about like when we talked about beavers and muskrats, kind of that same setup, because that's going to be very important uh, for groundhogs when they're underneath the ground. Now, they are probably one of the best hibernators that we have here in the state of Ohio, or I guess when it comes to mammals. Um, a lot of people think about bears, but uh, I, I don't know. I think groundhogs kind of take the cake. When they're hibernating, their heart rate goes to at least about four to five beats per minute. That's amazing. And also, too, their body temperature significantly drops to just about above freezing, so about 34, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Bears' heart rates do drop down a little bit. They're body temperature drops down a little bit, but I compare bears and groundhogs like diesel engines and uh, gasoline engines in the wintertime. So bears are like gas, gas engines. So um, they can be easily awoken from a warm snap versus groundhog, it really takes time uh, for them to really come into out of that uh, hibernational state. So again, really pay attention um, right now because uh, before too long, our uh, good old Buckeye Chuck friend is gonna be uh, hibernating. And uh, what's cool too about uh, groundhog's teeth going along with beavers and muskrats, their front incisor teeth never ever stop growing. For groundhogs, their front teeth grow about 1 16th of an inch every day when they're active, um, but when they're hibernating, um, their teeth don't grow as, as much. All right, so now we got some of our predators. We have uh, a red fox. This was uh, taken out in Marion Tallgrass Trail a couple years ago, a cute little pup. And um, these guys are omnivorous, so they will uh, eat plants and animals. So this time of year, they're gonna be trying their best to find mice, uh, but if not, they will eat uh, plant material. But these guys are a little bit different from their cousins from the gray fox. Um, the, the gray fox likes more wooded habitat, so think about like Hocking Hills, but red foxes, you're gonna find in more open land habitats. Um, so Marion County is a really good spot to find these guys. So here's another cute picture of, uh, of some other pups out by the Ridgedale School District. Um, so uh, how to identify them against uh, uh, gray foxes. So yes, you're going to say, oh, obviously gray foxes are gray and red foxes are red. But every once in a while, you can have a red fox that can be what's in a, a black morph or a dark morph. So and I know this picture is hard to tell, but uh, for the tail, they have white tip ears or, or white tip tail and black tip ears and gray foxes have uh, a black tip tail and white tip ears. So really cool way to identify. All right. Oh, good old coyotes. Yes. A lot of people don't like these guys. Um, now, these guys. Uh, are not native to the state of Ohio, kind of like the, uh, the fox squirrel situation. Um, these guys, uh, as, as uh, we came through, we opened the habitat, coyotes were like, oh, hey, let's, let's move over into the great state of Ohio. Also, too, 
um, when we got rid of their big competitor and also one of their predators, the, um, the, uh, the wolf, the, the coyotes got kind of excited and they're like, oh yeah, well, there's no one to compete against food. Uh, there's nobody to hunt us down, but yeah, let, let's move to the state. So they believe by 1919, they were first spotted in Preble County, which is clear in Western Ohio. Uh, and they believe by 1942, um, they believe they got here into Marion County. Now, some um, scientists don't think the coyotes you're seeing in Ohio or this part of the United States are not truly 100% coyotes. When it comes to Ohio, they think if they came from more of the northern regions up by the northwestern area by Michigan, they think they kind of interbred with wolves. And if they came from the east or south, excuse me, the, the west or southwest, they had more domestic dog uh, DNA in them. So, uh, but what's really interesting about coyotes is they can live in a lot of different kinds of habitats from forests to agriculture areas, to uh, open lands, to mountain regions, to deserts, to even downtown Marion. I have seen these guys in downtown Marion before. Uh, two years ago, um, Silver Street, which is also Holland Road. Um, I was coming from Tallgrass Trail to our county uh, building. And I, uh, I saw a coyote uh, running around uh, by uh, Fred's ice cream. I first thought it was a domestic dog, but how you can tell when they're running, have you ever yelled at your dog before, you know how they tuck their tail be in between their legs? Well, coyotes run with their tails down, but dogs run with their tails up. So that's a, another cool way how you can identify against dogs and coyotes. Because I know when you're looking at this picture, like, oh, that looks like a German Shepherd. They do kind of have the same colorations of a, uh, of a, excuse me, of a German Shepherd. So this was taken out by the Quarry Park, um, out by Marion Tallgrass Trail. Um, but as you can see, very majestic, very beautiful animal. But a lot of farmers don't like them because they are a nuisance. Um, they have, they can attack small livestock, but overall, I mean, they're after the wild stuff. All right, so we got Virginia opossum. So as uh, we talked about before, um, kind of the beginning of the uh, presentation, that these guys are the marsupials, the only marsupial we have here in North America. I know this is not a very clear picture. I took this off my phone. This was um, right next to the Port of John last year at uh, Marion Tallgrass Trail. Uh, but kind of like coyotes, they have a very, very mixed habitat. So. Um, you can find them, unfortunately, in downtown areas, and you can find them getting into uh, trash, but they will eat uh, small mammals, uh, small animals, uh, plants, things like that. And they actually have the most teeth of any uh, North American mammal. They have actually 50 teeth. And, uh, and I know when you're looking at this picture, you're looking at that long tail, and you're like, oh, that's cute. They can hang upside down. When they're young, they're able to, but as they get older, their body weight is actually too much for them. So their hind feet look a little bit different, um, kind of look like our hands. They actually have a kind of opposable thumbs. So with that specialized tail and their, their special hind feet, they're able to hang upside down. Um, so really, really adaptable, again, in all kinds of uh, different environments. So here's a picture, uh, not, not uh, taken far away from the Paradise Nature Center. As you can see, they're into somebody's uh, bird feeding stash. Um, so uh, yeah, they, they get in just about everything. Uh, but a lot of people don't like them because they look ugly. Um, as we, you probably have learned that, you know, they play dead um, to help, you know, to get away from predators because when they do that, they kind of release a pheromone, kind of like skunks, but it's not as strong as skunks. Now, as they're doing that, they're kind of in like almost of a deep coma state and the predators will go up and say, oh, I don't want that. That smells like death. I, I want a live prey. Then he comes awake and says, oh, I'm alive. And then he's able to uh, go about his day. And that's how they've been doing it here on Earth for many, many years. And I know the other big thing people say, oh, opossums carried rabies. Well, actually, it's very rare for an opossum to carry rabies because their body temperatures are actually a little bit cooler um, than most mammals. I forget what their, their average temperature, but it's not a, warm enough for the rabies virus to survive versus humans, dogs, raccoons, um, other animals like that. Um, we're, we're the perfect host for, uh, for rabies. All right, and I'm gonna save the best for last, uh, good old white-tailed deer. So only one that we have here in, in Ohio in the deer family. Uh, we, I guess we used to have another one, the elk, uh, but the last elk uh, was spotted in 1840. 
um, in Ashtabula County, and they were extirpated as well. But actually, uh, some of the recent history in 2009, there was a small pack of elk uh, crossing from the Ohio River. Um, so they are slowly coming back, but not enough to consider a population. I know that the vision of wildlife um, and a lot of different groups and organizations are really thinking about, should we introduce elk into Ohio? But we just don't have the, I, in my opinion, we don't have the, the proper habitat than when you go like out west, like Colorado. So some of the dark history with deer, as we've been talking about with all of our other animals, unfortunately deer did get extirpated. Uh, they believe by 1909, the last one was killed. Um, they, now there could have been some scarce, um, but they believe deer and turkey were gone after that date. And I actually had a gentleman, uh, when my first year working for the park district, he, he was from the Prospect region. And uh, he said about in the 1940s and in, uh, in Marion County, uh, he spotted a deer roaming around the, uh, the Scioto River and he was gonna call the Marion Star, but he said he didn't have his camera. And uh, he said, nobody would probably believe him. And I just think it's just so amazing that an animal we see just almost about every day, especially this time of year, was a ghost for a lot of our, uh, our older residents. You know, a lot of our older residents didn't get to grow up with deer. Luckily, my son, you know, who's only five right now, you know, we see deer just about every morning um, in Eastern Morrow County. So uh, we're pretty fortunate. But, um, but just like uh, uh, cottontail rabbits and coyotes, uh, these guys have learned to adapt as well. Now, yes, they are gonna be more abundant in your agriculture, open land, foresty areas, uh, but yes, you can find them in downtown Marion. I always get people sending pictures or videos or concerns uh, out by the Hardin Memorial. There's usually always a nice little group uh, that love, love hanging around there. There's, there's probably some nice, decent, uh, uh, protection and food sources out there by uh, the Hardin Memorial. So, um, but as you all know, the males are bucks and the females are does. And uh, and then this picture, Amy uh, Holloway captured of some triplets. Triplets, I mean, they, you can hear about it, but every once in a while, uh, but these guys are mainly you'll find uh, uh, twins. Uh, that's probably the most common. Uh, but here soon, uh, we're going to be finding a lot of our uh, bucks. They're going to be losing their antlers. This picture uh, Bob Turner got from the uh, Kyoto Plains Wildlife Area. Kind of looks like a unicorn right now uh, because it uh, shed off its, uh, its antler. All right, so conclusion, uh, mammals are a very unique group of animals. Uh, even though they come in all different shapes and sizes, they're, they're still amazing uh, group of critters. And, uh, you know, it is our job to, you know, to conserve and uh, our mammals for, for now and for future generations to come. And, and uh, a lot of the information came from the Ohio Division of Wildlife. Some of the images came from Google. I tried my best to give that credit, uh, but I won't name them all, but this is just some of our local photographers with some of the uh, pictures that you saw. But definitely Amy Holloway, Bob Turner, Eric Clark, Lilla Fryer, uh, they definitely uh, helped contributed a lot of pictures. So I really thank um, all these people for allowing me to share their wonderful work.